You are a perfect 10 out of 10 for taking 10 for CNN 10. I'm Carlo Zeus at the CNN Center. Day three of our fall production season begins in Russia. Last Thursday, there was an accident, an apparent explosion that killed at least five nuclear scientists at a military test site. But the nation's government didn't speak out about it until yesterday, when a Russian government spokesman said that accidents happen and that Russia was still, quote, far ahead in developing advanced weapons. There's an international mystery surrounding this incident. For one thing, it happened in a city of northern Russia that's only accessible by permit and it's closed off to international visitors. For another, officials in the area said there was a temporary rise in radiation levels after the explosion took place, though the Russian government says radiation levels were normal. Overall, that government has been pretty secretive about this incident in general. It says a blast did take place last week, but that it involved liquid fuel. And all this has analysts around the world speculating, though they don't know for sure, that the explosion involved a nuclear-powered cruise missile. Here's why that's significant. Last year, Russian President Vladimir Putin said his country had developed new weapons, ones that would make U.S. missile defenses ineffective. He said a new Russian missile would have an unlimited range and suggested it could avoid defense missiles for as long as needed. An accident at a secret military test range could come as an embarrassment to the Russian government. And it has a lot of control over the nation's media, so it's possible that information about this explosion is intentionally being kept quiet, which has some analysts suggesting this is a cover-up. Back in 1986, what was then the government of the Soviet Union initially tried to cover up an explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. To be clear, whatever happened last Thursday did not appear to have given off a large plume of nuclear radiation like the Chernobyl disaster did. But more than 30 years later, Chernobyl's effects are still rippling across Russia. It was 1.23 a.m. on April 26, 1986, when a routine test at the Chernobyl nuclear plant went horribly wrong, causing one of four reactors to melt down and explode. After the magnitude of the disaster became clear, so-called liquidators were sent in, trying to contain the radioactivity and seal the destroyed facility. But it took more than 24 hours for authorities to order the evacuation of nearby towns like Pripyat, where many of the plant's workers lived. Few understood they were leaving forever. And what they call their war continues. Cancer rates among thousands of people exposed to radiation remain high, as do birth defects in newborn babies. The area around Chernobyl is still an exclusion zone, but remarkably, some are defying orders to stay out. They say radiation levels are high, this woman says. Maybe radiation affects outsiders, people who have never come here. But what are old people like us afraid of? Chernobyl remains the worst civilian nuclear disaster in history. It changed the way many around the world feel about the use of atomic energy and still affects the lives of thousands 30 years on. Fred Plykin, CNN, Moscow. Ten second trivia. This is the chemical formula for what alkaloid? Cholesterol, nicotine, caffeine, or codeine? The bitter alkaloid that has this formula is caffeine. Caffeine works by stimulating the central nervous system. It's been called the most widely consumed drug in the world. But if you're among the 14% of Americans who suffer from migraines, a new study out of Harvard University says you should avoid having too much caffeine. So how much is too much? Well, researchers found that among people who suffered from severe headaches from time to time, figure between one and three per week, drinking one or two caffeinated drinks a day did not seem to have much of an effect on their migraines. But people who said they had three or more caffeinated drinks, like coffee, were more likely to get migraines on the days they drank that much. The study relied on people to report their own diets, and it didn't detail how much caffeine was in each drink they consumed. A large cup of coffee, for instance, would have more caffeine than a small cup of tea. But the study's author called it an important first step in figuring out where the line is between caffeine consumption and getting migraines. There was a lot of news coverage over the summer of NASA's Apollo 11 mission. July 20th marked exactly 50 years since Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin bounced along the surface of Earth's natural satellite. In the three years that followed, 10 more astronauts set foot on the moon, 
but no one's been there since 1972. The U.S. government is working on plans to return humans to the moon and for different reasons than why people first went there. But before anything actually gets off the ground, there are a lot of questions being asked about the cost, the value, and the level of enthusiasm. Nearly 50 years after humans first set foot on the moon, That's one small step for man. NASA is planning to go back, this time to stay. We're going to prove how to live and work on another world and then take all of that knowledge to Mars. That's the goal. Dubbed Artemis for Apollo's twin sister, NASA hopes to send a woman this time. The space agency originally planned a lunar landing for 2028, but in March, the Trump administration moved the deadline up by four years. Were you blindsided at all by the, the new timeline? Not at all. No, we have the opportunity to do this. A lot of things have to go right. I'm not saying that there's no risk here, but it can be done. It's good for our country. It's got NASA moving in a very serious way. NASA has already spent years working on a new rocket booster and a crew capsule for the mission. Once beyond Earth's orbit, astronauts will dock with a small space station. Lunar landers, built by commercial partners like Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, will carry astronauts back and forth from the moon. There's still a lot to work out, but the biggest obstacle probably isn't technology. As the saying goes, it's not rocket science that's the hard part, it's political science, convincing the politicians that they need to fund this adequately. Whatever it is that you think it might cost, um, it's probably actually going to be more. NASA estimates total cost could hit $30 billion over five years. So far, the White House has only asked for an additional $1.6 billion, but it wants that money to come from the federal Pell Grant program. I think that proposed uh, source of funding is a non-starter for many people. Uh, quite frankly, I was scratching my head as were many other people. If we're going back to the moon, Mars and beyond, we're gonna need more rocket scientists, not fewer. What do you think it's going to take to get that bipartisan support and also to get the American public jazzed about going back to the moon? I think when it comes to science, uh, there's not partisanship in Congress. When it comes to exploration, there's not partisanship in Congress. You walk around this agency, you talk to scientists and engineers, they can tell you exactly where they were when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon July 20th, 1969. Mm -hmm. I'm the first NASA administrator uh, that was not alive. I don't have that memory. I'll tell you what I do remember. I remember where I was uh, in fifth grade, Miss Powers' class, when, when Challenger exploded. The whole world was watching. Krista McCullough, the first teacher in space, was on the mission. So all teachers were interested. I'm sorry I'm getting a little emotional here. But the reality is that's, that's my kind of moment where I know exactly where I was. I want to be clear. Shuttles, amazing program. International Space Station, amazing program. But I don't remember where I was on each one of those launches. I remember where I was on that day. We need to do these stunning achievements to inspire the next generation. 50 years ago, the Apollo 11 mission changed the world. Now, the Artemis program could inspire a whole new generation. Rachel Crane, CNN, New York. Before the recent T-Rex race began in Nevada County, California, one thing was certain. There wouldn't be much pushing and shoving because little arms. This is what it looks like when a bunch of first responders put on inflatable Tyrannosaurus costumes and take off at a county fair. It sure doesn't look like Jurassic Park, but in the end, an engineer from the fire department crossed the finish line first. Was it historic? It was prehistoric. Was it audacious? It was Cretaceous. And it couldn't have been that easy to facilitate as at the tail end of the race, there were a couple Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> Still, there's no, no denying that everyone had a roar some time, and we hope you did too watching CNN 10.